Morning, everybody. Just saying, standing here for like 10 or 15 seconds, but like, it's like, I'm, I'm like, it feels like you stood here forever. Um, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Um, I just want to say, what an amazing morning this morning has been. It, it's just been one of those mornings where I, you just value people. I arrived, this, this has got nothing to do with sermon. I could probably just stop after this and then we'll go and have coffee. But I arrived this morning and the band were beginning to arrive, parked in the car park. Tommy, who was doing refreshments today, he was stood there ready with his shirt on. First thing he says to me, good morning. Hey, have you seen my Facebook page? I've changed my, 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 my banner on my Facebook to Hope House Church. So that was a great way to start the day. Thank you, Tommy, for that. that was great. Then we came in and, yeah, 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 good man. Then we came in and chaos reigned. It, it, like, I love it when I arrive early because loads of people come early to get things ready and get things set up. And that the lights aren't working. Lots of little issues. So nothing. Um, so it's a case of how do we do this? How do, and, and everybody was saying, is it turned on? <laughs> I never thought of that. Yeah, it's turned on. So we did all sorts of things like that and we ran around and we're like, then you go and think, I wonder if it's turned on. So you dash back and check it and, and then Paul went and checked it and then Dave went and checked it. So we all know that it's definitely turned on and plugged in. Um, and then what was really lovely is, is that we, right, what are we going to do? That will be fine. We'll manage. But then we were grabbing bits of spare lights to do something and people were holding nuts and bolts and I was throwing them all over the floor. People just jumped in so that this morning could still happen. So we could still be online. And I just love that about church, that, you know, kids workers are here early prepping and people are here getting this room ready. And, and some people, bless them, have came this morning and they came for the 10 o'clock service. So, so, so you are so welcome that you waited for the entire length of a service for the service to start. We love you. Um, people make it happen. People make it happen in God. And this final part, this is the short series I've been doing about momentum. Momentum beats the moment series. And it just seemed to me that this morning, in the moment, lots of things were happening. And it just wasn't working. But because we had momentum and vision and believe and we wanted it to happen, people just made it happen. And, it, you know, somehow when we're in that place, when we've got nothing left to rely on, but, Lord, we just need you to make it happen now. You know, then you have... You discover that like, you have a great time of worship. The fellowship and friendship is great. Um, and so let's just pray then that the word's going to be great as well to match all of that. We'll see. Um, that fell on stony silence. It's going to be hard work, that, isn't it? Flipping heck. Um, <laughs> I began this series by talking about Momentum Beats the Moment series. You know, and, and the first title is we start with breakfast. Momentum in God is a process. And then we went on to say, you know, sometimes we've got to get wet feet. Momentum is more than a moment. It's getting involved. M momentum is not just movement. And momentum, these were all scientific things. Um, momentum is impacted by the power that resides within us that causes that. Momentum means things happen. And here's my pastor's life lesson. When I do it my way, when I try to make things happen my way, it's the wrong way. And it always pushes back. But when I do it God's way, there is momentum with it. And things happen. So I went through some of Newton's laws. Can you all remember Newton's laws from your homework the last two weeks? Yeah. Oh, come on. Newton's first law of motion, the one on inertia. Well, you're getting there, but you're little, you're, an, an object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion at constant speed and in a straight line unless acted on by an unbalanced force. You remembered that, didn't you? came straight to your mind as soon as I read it. Yeah, of course you did. Listen, what I wanted to say, we need the momentum of God. We need the action of God upon our lives. We need him to touch you to change our lives. So today... Um, after we, the, three weeks ago we started with breakfast, then we got wet feet. This morning I want to say to you, we don't repeat. We don't repeat things. God is a God of new, a new day, a new opportunity. Um, momentum in God is an opportunity for everyone. Has anybody got one of those T-shirts? You know, the ones that kind of say, um, eat, sleep, repeat. Or cycle, eat, sleep, repeat. Or PlayStation, Eat, sleep, repeat. Anybody got one of those T-shirts? You've got one of those. Run, 
Eat, repeat. Yeah, 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 I've got that one as well somewhere. Rob, you used to, I'm sure you used to have one. Like PlayStation, obsess, probably forget to eat, never sleep, PlayStation, obsess. Yeah. We've all, we've all, you, you know the ones I mean, don't you? I'm going to expand a little more on last week's when we talked about God's people crossing the River Jordan, going to the other side. And I love it that behind them was 40 years. Behind them was 40 years. And in front of them, to a large extent, was the unknown. Or well, they had the promises of God, but the land was unknown. They were going into territory to do things they'd never done before. And for 40 years, they'd got a way of living, a way of being, a way of doing, a way of existing, a way of getting through that they knew, that felt right, that seen God move in that 40 years. But then God says, no, now we're crossing over. Now it's the unknown. And I just wonder how that must have really made people feel. So I'm going to read you Joshua chapter 3, uh, verse 1. You can turn to it if you want to in your, your digital Bibles, in your um, paper Bibles, or whatever format you use. You can conjure back your memory because you've got great memories. But early in the morning, so it's breakfast time, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from a place called Shittim, away, which is always worth leaving, I've got to say. Uh, <laughs> And went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing... Well, come on, it just is. But they camped before crossing over. Don't blame me, it's biblical. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. We don't repeat things. In God, we've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go too near. Joshua has told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priest, take up the ark of the covenant, pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all, the Israel, of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the ark of the covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in it. Get your feet wet. And Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you all the various heights that are in the land. See the ark of the current of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Remember the ark is about the word of God and the presence of God. I love these verses, and I'll tell you what I love about them more than anything else, because it's about all the people. Now, you imagine all the people that over a 40-year period, the young, the old, the experienced, the inexperienced, the capable, the incapable, the educated, the uneducated. The, I mean, 40 years of people, and all that that is, and I love that. This message is to all the people, not just the successful, not just the bright and best. There's no meritocracy here. I'm not a big fan of that. This is about all the people. You know, whoever we are in God, we are part of all his people. And I love that. That You know, the qualification is that I'm looking at him, that I belong to him. That is it. I adore this verse. You know, we need to get hold of the truth of that. Whatever our past 40 years, you may not have lived 40 years yet. Whatever your past contains, whatever you, the way the world may perceive you. Because remember, these people are all ex-slaves. No matter what you may appear to be, no matter what you may have done, I love the things that Megan shared this morning. Remember, when it comes to God, all the people, all the people are users. It doesn't cream off the elite. All the people. When God's people got to the River Jordan, they camped there for a while, three days. We've camped here in this place. Oh, let's be We've been in this, this building for six plus years now. I think it's seven years the end of this year. God. What might God do now? What might God do next? Yeah. What might happen? Um, I just want to tell you that uh, many years ago, I went hiking in the Lake District. I have no idea why I did that. Um, but I went hiking in the Lake District for three days. 
and we were trying to do as many peaks as we could in those three days. And each night we went to Valley Bottoms to camp. And we went and camped at the Valley Bottoms. And I've got to tell you, at the va Valley Bottom was the tent, was the sleeping bag, was the warm sleeping roll mat, was food, was relative comfort. And I would have merrily stayed in that tent at the bottom of that valley all the next day, rather than get up, pack up, and climb the next peak. I enjoyed the familiar, warm, safe. Except I was in the bottom of a valley, in a bag, on a mat on the floor, eating semi-cooked food, under canvas. But you know what? Even the worst situations can seem appealing when it comes to change. Now, the next day I got to go up, climb the peaks, and when I got back at the end of the day, that day ended with a proper bed and a shower and warm food. But I could have stayed at the bottom of the valley in a tent under canvas on the floor because it felt easy at that moment. You know, it's good to camp in one place for a while. When we stop, it gives us time to get cleaned up, um, sort ourselves out a little, chill out by the campfire, sing Gingangoli or Kumbaya and all that kind of thing. You know, to go nowhere, to do nothing, to contemplate things. This is what happens. We, get, we begin to talk, we contemplate life, we begin to discuss things, we begin to debate, we begin to disagree, we begin to dispute, we begin to digress, and we forget the next leg of the journey. When a church stands still too long, when any of us stand still too long, discussion becomes dispute. We digress and we forget that we're called on a journey. We begin to lose vision. See, see I am doing a new thing is the very heart of our God. You know that I, you know, I don't want to get up and carry on. Sometimes I want to stay where I am because it's familiar. But the best is in pressing forward. I want to read to you these actual minutes taken from a... Because we do take minutes in core team meetings, senior leadership at Hope House Church. And I'm going to read these out to you because these are actually reflect where we are in God today. Frodo... I can't do this, Sam. <laughs> Sam, I know, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo. You've got to imagine me and Neil. The ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger, they were. And sometimes you don't want to know the end. I have to put that voice in, didn't I? Because how, no, I'm not. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when, when so much bad has happened? But at the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come when the sun shines. It shines out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you. That meant something, even if you were... Too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now, uh, forking those stories had lots of chances of turning back. Only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. Yeah. What are we holding on to, Sam? That there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Yeah. That is the only good bit of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> The rest of it's just tedious. Oh, no, Riders of Rowan, they're quite good. Because um, they're like Vikings on horses, so they've got to be good. Um, sometimes we feel like, what is the point? And those verses, those verses, those words from, from Lord of the Rings, it kind of sums up that, what is the point? Well, there is a point, because God's not done yet. Because God's not done yet. And when you're at that place where you're saying, what is the point? We just read big stories about things of the past. Listen, the big stories about the things of the past were where God moved. And in our story today, God can move. And so the big story, stories haven't ended. We're in one. We can be the big story that somebody in the future tells. Because God. God never intends for us to stay in one spot permanently. There's a call and purpose over us bigger than the moment we're in. And of course, it's so easy to get trapped in the moment we're in. You know, there's a God opportunity when we begin to move. Because the minute we begin to move, we become dependent upon him. And not just my experience. We can't just keep repeating the same old day. You've all seen the film Groundhog Day, and there's been loads of various that way. You just keep repeating the same day. And you might get better at that day, but it's still the same day. Ultimately, the only life worth living then is when that day changes and we move. Church, we've got to be a church that moves. We've got to be Christians, individual Christians, a gathering of all God's people that are prepared to move. But 
what does that look like? You know, as we move, we face two equal and opposite forces. That, that, that was the Newton bit. One is a momentum builder, but one is a momentum breaker. A momentum builder is one where momentum is found in a God-focused movement where we're looking at Jesus. You remember the people across the Jordan? They followed the ark, the presence and word of God. We see the presence of God and we follow it. A movement breaker is where momentum is drained by an opinion-focused movement. We hold on to an opinion and fight for it. Well, in my opinion. Anybody use that phrase? I'm, I'm, no, three of us. Three of us have, have, have actually said in conversation, well, in my opinion. Because you never say, well, in my opinion. You only ever say, well, in my opinion. It's one of those like, I dare you, phrases. One is the call of God on your life, and the other becomes the control of religion over your life. Opinion will always make you religious. Presence of God will always bring you freedom. It will always bring you the call of God. So listen to this. Being a Christian is not about what you have to do. I said this before. It's about what you get to do when the desires of God are alive inside you and fill you with joy. So the question is, what does God want? Because what God wants, I want. Religion doesn't understand who you are in Jesus, and so it resorts to commands and demands and expectations that kills and removes joy from inside you. And we soon slip into being religious, don't we? But we want to be a God presence people that are filled with his joy and understand what he wants because it's what we want. It's, bu it's building within us. You know, when I was young, I was taught to draw by looking at the object more than the pencil in my hand. And my art teacher said, look at the object and glance at your pencil. And the pencil will touch the paper, look at the object, and you'll begin to draw the right line. I was told to keep my eye on the point ahead, the next point, and I would draw the right line to it. In Psalm 17, verse 5, it says this, My next steps, my steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I want to walk in the paths of God. Not my opinions, but his call. My steps have held fast to your paths. What do we do um, when we... Do, <laughs> What we do, uh, t what do we tell our children when we teach them to play something like table tennis? I'm, I'm, I'm gambling here, but I'm going to pretty much show you, you're going to say to the kids, keep your eye on the ball. Yes, keep your eye on the ball. When you're pl <laughs> playing football, keep your eye on the ball, because I never kept my eye on the ball. Anybody done that thing? And it's gone past them. Or you've swung your leg and you've missed it all together. Has anybody like played golf? What is that about? <laughs> a stick and a ball in a field. Keep your eye on the ball. Teachers tell their students, keep your eyes on your own paper. Church pastors, keep your eyes on your own church. I, I love the internet, but we're in Barnsley, not Bethel. God's called you here. What could God do here? Focus where your eyes are determines the difference between success and failure. What we focus on influences the direction of our life and what we're able to do. If I focus on the table tennis ball, I can hit it. If I can focus on my pencil, I can draw with it. If I look on the object. If, if I can focus on the football, I can kick it. If I look where I'm going, I can reach it. If I look at Jesus, I can follow him. verse 11 of that original reading it said they see the ark the presence of the covenant of the lord of all the earth will go into the jordan ahead of you see he always goes ahead of us he don't just sort of say off you go then good luck he goes ahead of us yeah. you're never abandoned in every situation of life in every walk of life you're not an abandoned person he goes with you in Hebrews chapter 12, it says this. You'll be familiar with these verses. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You know what's remarkable? He fixed his eyes on us. He fixed his eyes on us first. A Christian that fails to center on Jesus grows weary and loses heart. They opt for easy. They opt out. They will follow anything. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Otherwise, we'll miss 
the journey. Our focus impacts our current circumstances, and that has eternal consequences. You know, we can trade off Jesus' focus for a quick win or quick pleasure now, but we'll lose our eternal victory. And we're people called to an eternal victory. Did you know that? But there are so many things, so many nice things, so many good things, so many possible things, so many easy ways out, so many things I want to do, so many things I want to have, so many places I want to go that I can look at and be more excited about than I can about Jesus. And in this moment, this is not, bear with me, in this moment, I may even feel I'm having a better time in that experience than I would be with Jesus. But I won't have an eternity. Church, we've got to be people that are prepared to live with our eyes fixed on Jesus. And as we fix our eyes on him more and more, our experience in this moment begins to transform. It becomes, becomes your kingdom come. Because our opinions are squeezed out and the presence of God is poured in. So let me explain then. Now, it's at this point on Friday night, I was typing up the rest of the sermon that I got a bit convicted. So I'm just going to stop here and confess something to you right now. I am not a perfect pastor. It's the hardest fight I have to fight. <laughs> Your shock at that is so genuine, it's overwhelming. Um, <laughs> Listen, the statement I just made a few minutes ago is a massive one I wrestle with. We can trade off God focus for a quick win, but lose an eternal victory. It all depends on our focus. That is the hardest thing to deal with. The hardest thing to deal with in our lives. It's the hardest thing I deal with in my life. How can I get a quick win as opposed to invest in that victory, focusing on Jesus? Without, you know, without the presence of the Holy Spirit, vision uh, and opinion will always become, will always compete and bring defeat into my life. So I need the Holy Spirit vision. Otherwise all my opinions crowd out and crowd in. And I just know defeat. In Acts chapter 16, get this. This is, this is Paul the Apostle. Who thinks Paul the Apostle like, well, like the super apostle? It's like He just does amazing things in God. Where he goes, God goes. Where he goes, miracles happen. He's just like, wow. Most of our New Testament and most things we believe and teach because he explained them. And this is what happens to him. Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. That, just that phrase alone, as a theologian, blows my mind. And when they came to the border of Mycenae and tried to enter Bithynia, uh, but, the Holy, but the Holy Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Oh, let's go and preach the good news of Jesus to these people that don't know him. We want to tell them all about our loving, saving God. And the Holy Spirit says, no. I, I'm having to look at Mark. I need, I need reassurance at this point. <laughs> His opinion was that was the best thing to do. The Holy Spirit had a bigger plan. Had a big, it's not that God doesn't care about those people, but church, we are part of a bigger plan, and we need, we need a vision of Jesus more than we need my opinion to win. Because in his opinion, it was a good thing to do. But we don't want the good things, we want the God things. Paul wanted to do a good thing, but needed to do the God thing in his life. The Holy Spirit is more important than a good idea or a wrong focus. You see, good things might have happened. But God things happened when he was obedient to him. Church, you may have a pile of good things in front of you, good things you want to do and good things you want to try, but let's do the God things. Because yeah. I promise you, very few people I know, very few people in this church or friends are around here really get into bad things. They get into good things, but good things can be a huge distraction from the God things. Yeah. And I know because that's been my experience. A wrong focus. You know what that is? It's the discussion that becomes a dispute about the chairs, where the chairs go and what colour they should be. I mean, why have we got red and blue chairs and not just blue chairs? Yeah, here's the thing. Are you sat down this morning? We're winning. You've got a chair. You know, it's when we obsess and have opinions about the colours of carpets or the lack of windows in a building, or the sign attached to the building, or whether we have round tables or long tables. It's about projectors or HDMI. It's, it's about wireless mics or ones with cords. It's the songs that we sing and when do we stop singing them and bring new ones in. Or where do I stand on stage? Am I important enough? Um, 
Uh, what cups do we use? Pot ones or disposable ones? What about the environment? Well, what about washing up? Well, it's, it's when we all of that stuff becomes our focus and not going. I want to promise you, church is full of all, all churches across the world are full of opinions about these things. You know, but the attitude we present to others in them tells us everything about where our focus is. It's the coffee we serve on a Sunday morning. Well, actually, no, that actually is a God thing, and it's really important. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Lord has a unique revelation he's given me about the type of coffee we should serve. Because um, so, God loves coffee, he invented it. It's a wrong focus. When the spiritual language is stripped away, it's anything where we want our way. I am going to have my way on this. The minute we begin to think or feel that way, we've lost focus on Jesus. The bottom line, it's our opinion. I'm going to get happier, don't worry. Um, the bottom line is it's our opinion that we want to impose on other people so we can have the power to get what we want. I've seen it happen. I've done it. I've had it done to me. I've seen it happening because we're people. But here's the great thing. And God says all the people, all the people come into his presence and he gives all the people a direction and a vision and a purpose and a call and an ability. It's the moment we take our eyes off Jesus and value personal opinion over a Jesus-centered vision, things begin to break. The minute we refocus on Jesus, things begin to repair. Jesus is king, and we are honestly seeking the kingdom of God. We can't have our own way all the time and expect to gain an eternal significance. Your, your way may get you an, a, a significance now, but Jesus' way gives us a significance for eternity. changes everything. I want to be, I want to be found in a place... When I'm surrounded through eternity by people that I once had a conversation with that say to me, because of the, your attitude to me, because of what you shared with me, I became a Christian. Or I continued with God. Or you built me up and discipled me. You encouraged me as a friend. And I'm here now in the presence of God because of your obedience to Jesus. That's, that's who I want to live to be. Why do I say that? Because Jesus said, unless a seed falls into ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. And Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. See, what that is, is all the things that make me me have been subjugated and put down and put, done away with. And my life is now hidden with Christ. Scripture actually talks about my life being hidden with Christ. And when he lives, I live. Right focus means we are hearing God before promoting our own opinion. Opinions can soon be a force to oppose God's will. They will always want to settle for less to settle for our good rather than God's goodness. And we want God's goodness for our town. Don't we want God's goodness for our town? Yeah. There, do you know, I, I have been amazed this week in different meetings and committee meetings and gatherings. There is so many people wanting to do good things in our town and good things for our town. And I am thrilled about that. But what I want to see is the goodness of God in our town. Yeah. That's a whole different level of goodness. So let's have a look at some Bible text. Verse 3. When you see the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from the positions and fo from your positions and follow them. You know, we so easily get entrenched as people. Oh, this is what we are. This is how we do church. But when God's on the move, we've got to say, hey, you know what? What matters is where God is going and we're going with him. Yeah. Get ready to move because we have a God on the move. We have to abandon our position and take up God's position in our lives and in the lives of others. What might God do in this place? What if God begins to move? Now, does, that, does it worry anybody in this room when I say God might be about to move? Wow, thank God for you all because it terrifies me. Because um, I start thinking, well, hmm, what if I become superfluous to requirements? What if I'm not good enough? What if I start to get it wrong? I really, I kind of want God to move, but I'm familiar with what we've got now. I feel secure. I know how it works. I know how to turn it on. I know how to make the lights work. Oh, hang on. I don't know how to make the lights work. We know how to turn the lights on in church. It works. Verse 4, And since you have never travelled this way before, they will guide you. The presence of God. The word of God will guide you. Church, I think the Lord is going to move us into a place that we've never been before. And we've, we've had a 40-year history from when I first walked through a door into a place called Barnes Christian Fellowship. Uh, and we are now Hope House Church, where I've never been this way before. And we've never been this place before. 
the territory God's people were going into was unfamiliar to them. They never travelled that way. So the presence of God is essential. Church, I am thrilled these last few weeks and months, that sense that the Holy Spirit is around this place. It's touching lives, it's beginning to speak, it's beginning to, to influence and change how we see things, how we perceive one another, how we act, what we do. Because we, church, we need the Holy Spirit like never before. And maybe you personally do. Maybe you're facing a new job. Maybe there's health recovery, health issues, relationships, practical jobs to be done, parenting, changing your situations or a role or your age, uh, just living on Monday morning. The call of God over us, his vision for you and for this church means we need the presence of God. You need the presence of God every day. You know, it's not enough to do good things. We need to be involved in the God things. This territory we're going into is unfamiliar to us. None of us have ever done this before. Your leadership have never done this before. And I feel like the rest of this year is going to be an increasingly significant time for us. Time of change and opportunity. And what we need to do is to be the people so filled by the Holy Spirit, we're able to say, not there, but there. Yeah. Even when the good thing presents itself, what is the God thing? And in your personal life, I just want to encourage you with this. What if God is speaking into and over your life? So many good things you could do, but only one God thing you need to do. And so I encourage you to get before God. When everything may seem unfamiliar or even fearful, we focus on Jesus, our King, yeah. his presence, yeah. his word. The two things we need in Jesus are his word and his Holy Spirit above anything. The forces for momentum and movement that can't be resisted. There is no equal and opposite strength before Jesus. He is the victory. He has our victory. We walk in it. The battle does belong to him, and the victory is won for us. They can never have an equal or opposite force that can overcome the name of Jesus. God has poured out his Holy Spirit in this place, and we've seen, we've been strengthened by that. We've found courage to go into new places. You know, Joshua never let his people settle and become familiar with where they were. Jesus never allows his people to remain where they are and get completely familiar with the new territory. He moves them on. Yeah. He grows them. He builds them. Yeah. Church, I just believe God wants to grow us and to build us. Numerically, but in activity, in purpose, in direction, the things that we do. And it is scary. But God. Yeah. There are things God has in store for us that we will never experience until we place our complete confidence in him. And I love that Joshua said to all the people, we're all going we're all doing this. And the, the priest led the way and got wet feet, but everybody else crossed over on dry land. Sometimes we just have to say, we're going to do it. We're going to abandon our position and take up God's position. We're going to follow him. So I encourage you and challenge you this morning. Are you actually prepared to stick with what you are familiar with? Or prepared to say, I am moving my position. This will cost everything I know, but I will gain every promise of God when I go. Even though I can't see what they will be, I believe God's promise is faithful. When I look at this church, I want to say, you have changed my world. You have changed my world. So you are already world changers. Who you are, the friendships, the connections, the encouragement, the support, changes everything about how I live my life. So you're already changing my world. We are gathering people from around, you know, as a church, we're beginning to gather people from around this world, building them up together so that we can send them out into the world. So Hope House Church can be good news people that our world changes. And I love that in God we can have that kind of significance, not for our glory, but for his. By carrying Jesus into our world, our, our world, your world, we carry such a force for good news in our lives that nothing can stand against it. With the life-giving, life-changing momentum of the power of Christ residing within us, we get to be the image of God that people see in our Monday morning world. You can be the image of God that people see in your circumstances. So I just want you to pause for a moment to think, what will my Monday morning look like? How will I be? What will I be facing? What could happen? You know, the reality is, your situation will be what it is, but God, but God's presence, 
God's word. And I really believe that can change everything. What, no matter what circumstance you face, no matter what disappointment, no matter what challenges, no matter what joys, no matter what opportunities, God, but God, but Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit. It says in Matthew chapter 10, the message version, stand up for me against world opinion and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. If you turn tail and run, do you think I'll cover you? Don't think I've come to make life cosy. I've come to cut. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. We are intimately linked in this harvest work. Anyone who accepts what you do accepts me. The one who sends you, anyone who accepts what I do accepts my Father who sent me. Accepting a messenger of God is as good as being God's messenger. Accepting someone, someone's help is as good as giving someone help. This is a large work I've called you into. But don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Well, we started in Barnsley. We started small. We start in your life and my life. We start small. But God. Can the band come back up, please? I read this quote by Rich Validus, a pastor in Queens in, in Brooklyn, New York. And he said this, Everywhere Jesus went, he lived like he was sent. Let's treat every part of every day like an assignment we are sent on. Church, you are a sent people. You are a sent people. In your situation, when you go to the doctors, when you go to the shop, when you meet with your family, when you go to work, when you go to the unemployment line, when you do whatever it is you're going to do tomorrow morning, you are a sent people. Because in every situation, every circumstance of life, you can be the image of Christ in your attitude and behavior and conduct and responses, in the surrendering of your opinions and the release of God's heart. So let's take every opportunity to be a Monday morning changer. So let me finish this way. You are sent on assignment this Monday morning. You can focus on the Monday morning experience or you can experience a Monday morning life with a focus on Jesus. Yeah. And I want to have a focus on Jesus this Monday morning. Yeah. And then I can truthfully and confidently say, you will see a victory. Yeah. I'm going to ask that we stand together, please. If you're capable, if you can, if you physically can. I wanted to speak in these last two or three sessions I've done with the hope of, of beginning to shake us, beginning to challenge us, beginning to help us to see that just coming back into the room, just being able to be back in person, just be able to be back in person and be able to watch online and create something is not God finished. It's not enough. It's not done. It's settling for just the beginnings. It's settling for looking at what could be. God has so much more. We're surrounded by a rich harvest in a town where so many people don't know who Jesus is. So many people in your life don't know who Jesus is. So many good things we could do, but so many God things we can do for him. So I'm just going to pray over us that we catch a vision for the future, a vision for change, a vision to, to serve and to reach out. Lord, we pray that you will help us as a whole people Whatever our background, whatever our age, whatever our expectation, whatever our previous experience, Lord, we want to have a vision of Jesus and the presence of your Holy Spirit, the knowledge of your word, so that we can go out into new things. We can step out. And Lord, I want to pray that you give us the courage to put down even good things so that we've got hands able to pick up the God things in front of us. Lord, we don't quite know what we're going into, but we know that you've made promises. We know, Lord, that you will have a people in this place. We know, Lord, that, that your Holy Spirit, your good news, will touch and change this town. We know that Jesus, the King, will be lifted up. So we pray, Lord, now that through this coming week, through our Monday morning, through this year ahead, we will be the kind of people that are prepared to step up, to stand up and say, we're abandoning our position to follow God to follow Jesus, to cross over into promises. Whatever they may be, Lord, give us courage. And we pray that you would give us courage. Give us courage to say yes and to say no. 
give us courage to be prepared to stand up and to be the ambassadors of Christ, to be the image of Jesus in our town, in our family, in our workplace, on our street, in the shop, in our everyday living. It's not me that lives, but Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit. As we worship in this last song now, we pray that you'll pour out your Holy Spirit. On people at home, watching on, at home, or people online, would you pour out your Holy Spirit that you would bring, that you would lift them and transform them and bring courage to their lives. Lord, for people in this room, that you would lift them, transform them, bring courage into their lives so that we could get hold of the good things of God, the promises of God, not just for today, but for tomorrow. Lord, that we would stand up, abandon everything we've got that is ours, surrender it to you, and grab hold of everything that you promise us. All the good things of your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.